All right. Office Hours, episode 18. Boom. Welcome back, everyone. This is going to be a good one. Yeah, Nick. You got a um, little hat or hair thing going on. Like, were you wearing a hat or maybe even a mask earlier? I was wearing a mask. You were? Yeah. Great. Tell me about that. (laughs) Wait, are we talking about the literal mask or the mask that we put up for emotion's sake that's such a good question yeah <laughs> this is the question that ashanti branch has been dealing with for all of the past like year and a half or 30 <laughs> i mean yeah that too <laughs> yeah but um no what makes you say that is my hair sticking up no it looks fine i just wanted to somehow get a convenient segue into masks oh well done <laughs> it was kind of not really <laughs> so who's our guest and why did you bring ashanti up branch he's the direct executive director of ever forward club in hayward that mentors the youth in the bay area and helps them primarily by identifying the use of masks and how they may or may not be serving us in our life mm-hmm Can you tell me a little bit more about masks? What are they? Why do we use them? We are all wearing masks and the function of them metaphor, it's a metaphor for Mm -hmm. putting on a face that everybody sees, but on the inside of that mask is the real things that you're going through or struggling with that you don't let people see. Mm. So the practice that he takes people through is writing three things on the outside of the mask that you show the world three things on the inside of the mask that you keep hidden from the world. And it is a very valuable way of, I think just on a basic level, admitting to yourself that you are going out of your way on a daily basis to keep a part of who you are from society. And that is a thing that takes an an incredible moment of honesty with yourself. That's not very often achieved. Mm. And I think that's what makes it so effective is when he creates a space that allows people to have that brutal honesty with themselves, they realize that there's pieces of themselves that they may want to change. Yeah. It's like this whole isolation piece, right? We don't show this because we feel like there's probably not that many people going through similar things. Mm -hmm. And then once we acknowledge it to ourselves and then talk about it with other people, Mm -hmm. it's like, oh my God. Everybody has this. Everybody's going through some type of struggle. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think there's like an interesting like underlying theme in there that we didn't even actually get into, but it's just this idea of like like the the matter of factness in life that is that there will be hardship and struggle, right? Like mm-hmm. it's kind it's like that what's the right wording like the um not an existential question or whatever, but maybe a little bit of like, and feeling like, and that isn't a very isolating feeling, like knowing that there is no question about it, that life is going to bring you disaster and trauma and fill in the blanks and people, certain people, different degrees and whatever. But I think what is, liberating about the mask process is that it takes you from a point of not understanding what those things are in your life and like you said it helps people bring their their hidden portions of their mask to light and let's and it helps you bring other people into that isolation Mm -hmm. yes which helps you then confront some of the tragedy that you may be feeling in your life. Yes. Yeah. And I like what you're saying. I think this is my favorite piece about this is that he does acknowledge that it's so powerful just to name that we're wearing masks, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't like say that it's a completely wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Like he says that there's a utility behind us wearing masks. And at the same time, Like if we only have these masks on all the time in front of other people, like that's going to be a detriment as well. 
Like right. the all or nothing on both sides can be bad. There mm -hmm. like is a balance with these things. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, I think a, a phrase that would often be used in like culture towards somebody who like is wearing a mask, right? Is like, oh, that person's fake. Mm. But I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Like, do we, you know, I think it's, if you're going to say that about somebody, you should take a really hard look at why they may be acting a certain way. Because I think one of the things that I love about the whole idea of wearing masks is like, you don't know what's going on in somebody else's life. Mm. You know what I mean? You bump into somebody on the street and they may take out some anger on you. You have no clue what's going on in that person's life. So why not show them a little bit of compassion? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, I think that's the biggest, like more than, you know, if you get a group of eight young teens together and they have an opportunity to share things that are going wrong with them, it's it's less of an opportunity to share something about yourself as it is for a, a moment for seven other people to not come back to you with anger and judgment about what you're doing. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that is the feeling of like, growth and acceptance and positivity that can come out of a, such a negative feeling when you tell some seven people or whatever, just in the example I'm giving that you're going through this and none of them, it doesn't sh change anybody's perception of you, you know, mm -hmm. like you're still the same person, but now maybe somebody gets you more and that's, and they still obviously accept you. And that's, an incredible growth moment for an individual who can share that and experience that. So I think that's, I'm actually, it's interesting because I think to a certain degree that is a more impactful and that's what he does with ever forward club, right? Like he's getting small groups mentoring together to talk about these things on a more regular basis. And, mm -hmm. and that repetition of convincing yourself, Hey, these people don't care, but then it's easy to leave and you know this th these people don't care to fill in like a just a random example that i have an abusive household right and then you come back the next week and they still don't care and then you come back the next week and they still don't care and then you come back the next week and they still don't care you probably start to believe that they really don't care mm -hmm. you know what i mean and that that doesn't define you yeah and so that repetition piece i think is the best part of what he's able to accomplish um in my opinion i mean obviously there's tons of great stuff he does but um yeah i think that's like a really key piece to you know again we kind of bring it up in the interview but like shifting identity mm -hmm. and overcoming some of the anxieties you have about the pieces of your current identity that you don't want to share right and i'm curious now too about like how maybe in some interactions that we have in the workplace say you get a new job mm -hmm. and you have certain interactions with staff, maybe in team meetings, and you come off a certain way, and that's not completely true to who you are. It doesn't completely define your whole self, right? Mm -hmm. um, but now your coworkers see you in this one way. They see that one mask that you have. Right. Like I'm, yeah, I guess I'm just curious about like, what kind of impact does that have on us? Because I definitely find myself maybe like, in different work settings that I'm in, maybe in a different classroom setting, and then with my friends, mm -hmm. like I'm putting on and taking off different masks. Sure. And it's really interesting. And I'm wondering about like how this is curating my identity development as a person. It's it's kind of like a reward system, right? Like if I behave in this certain way, if I'm like super optimistic or something in the workplace, people feed off that, they like it. They're going to want that more so if they tell you like, oh man, you have great energy. Like I love you being around here. Mm -hmm. um, I love that kind of energy. You're going to be like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, I'll keep this energy up. And then positive feedback loop. Yes. Do it again. Get more feedback. Do it again. Get more feedback. Yeah. And that's great. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. It's great to encourage this positivity, but yeah. What if I don't have that positive energy one day? Here's a, here's an interesting thing that I think kind of lends into what you're talking about. Is there a requirement psychologically to 
maintain like what you're describing in a sense is like an extremely shallow perspective on who you are you're you're only showing one of your many masks Mm -hmm. so there's a very there's a lack of depth in in your in the understanding of who nick is in the workplace setting that you're describing yeah so is there i guess my question to like help build on this idea that you have is there a requirement of exposing people to multiple masks to achieve a depth that would then build on a positive psychological relationship in that workplace if you only leave it to one are you missing something right yes that is a very good question yeah (laughs) and like when is it too much in a workplace that you're if you're sharing and self-disclosing about all these different parts of your life or how you're feeling like, do you cross a line at some point to where there are work boundaries maybe that you want to set and now it's gone too far? I, you see, this is an interesting question too. I think there's a very interesting like rhetoric about around like workplace behavior, mm-hmm. but man, like, I just don't think it's human. It's not. You know right? what I mean? Like to say that like you need to have your workplace persona yeah. all tied up. It's like, God, why not just be one person? You know what I mean? <laughs> Brendan, that's stupid. Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. But like, for real, I think we do talk a lot about like, oh, I don't want to overshare personal life at work. Yeah. And I don't want to, oh, like whatever it is, like at work, like we, we're, we've got this narrative in society that we need to be at work and at work, therefore you're holding back who you are. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that's a very common sentiment. People try and pass along. But I would not, I would say that that builds fractured and like partitioned relationships, because if that's the case, then nobody really knows who anybody is. And how can you really give a fuck? Excuse my language. I think the first time I dropped a big old (laughs) F-bomb on the show, but like, how can you ever really care about who somebody is if all you know is, you know, they make a really good pot of coffee in the morning (laughs) when they come in. And like, and they always smile and wave to me. Like, yeah, there's just nothing there. Yeah. So, but it's uh, to like devil's advocate on this. You open yourself up to all of the questions and criticisms and anxieties around telling people who you really are. And that's scary too. Right. Is that going to be a barrier and you maybe scaling up in the workplace if you share something that people are like, oh God. And then that gets word to your upper management or boss. And now it's like, oh, you know, like we see this person differently now. Mm-hmm. Like that's a risk. And that's yeah. unfortunate. It's mm-hmm. that sh- It shouldn't be that way, right? Yeah. It's complex. It is very complex. But uh, the F-bomb, that was appropriate. I could hear your passion behind HR with this. I mean, know? it's... Well, it's actually like, I would actually say that's like the opposite of the HR thing to say. Yeah. Is like, you know, I think it's very HR to like want to maintain a level of privacy in the workplace. And I mean, obviously like there's confidentiality that's required. Mm -hmm. You're not going to encourage somebody to go like blab about their life story to everybody in the office. But on a human level, Man, like if you want to build like a legitimate relationship with somebody, don't just talk about the weather and the coffee in the break room. You know, like that's just not going to get it done. What did you do this weekend? <laughs> yeah, right? So, yeah, do you have any if you were to give like recommendations, things that are like on your mind in this topic on like how would people continue to navigate building healthy work/ slash life relationships um where do you think people should go how should they go about it um what what do you think like i think the happy hour is like a great starting place right yeah i mean so i think about my work experience right now and one of the things that i've really enjoyed this year um, which I know, so groups, we have this thing called group supervision mm-hmm. to where you typically meet with your coworkers. You talk about clinic cases. Um, how can I best support this client that maybe I'm feeling like I'm a little challenged with right now? 
and a lot of different stuff. And for this year with my coworkers, we just had a space that is like an hour and a half long. And we talked about things that were coming up in terms of like work struggles. Uh, but then we'd also do like a check-in about how we're feeling ourselves, what's coming up for us. Um, and it was just a great way for us to like feel together. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the stressors that maybe I talked about or a coworker talked about, we were like, man, yeah, I'm feeling the same stuff. Like it feels like a lot. And it was just a nice time for us to pause. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's way different than just like a staff meeting or a team meeting to where you're going through structured details about the workday. This was a space to where you could just get anything off your mind. If you wanted input from somebody else, they can provide it for you. And that space was so like refreshing. Yeah. Like it was so healing. And we had a great facilitator who would like have us do mindfulness, breathing exercises to start the whole supervision. Um, so we were like really able to come into the space and then, you know, we were just open to share. And I felt so connected to my coworkers in that sense because they were going through a lot of the same stuff I was going through. Mm -hmm. um, and they were going through a lot of different stuff. But I think that's where, like, I I think about this boundary of, like, of course I'm not going to share everything about my personal sure. life yeah, that's going on. But if I'm sharing some of these stressors that are coming up for me that I think are applicable to what we're doing in this workplace, or maybe they're just applicable to my performance at work right now, mm -hmm. and that can get validated, maybe it can get shared. Um, yeah, I think there's, a, there's definitely a line between deep moments and authentic moments yes and i don't think they all need to be deep but no. you need to have authentic moments with people that aren't just like again coffee and weather yeah right? like i'm struggling with this or or like you said something that you are struggling with from a meeting and you pull somebody aside and be like hey like i really am actually second guessing what i said in there like do you think it was perceived the wrong way like i don't want to come off like so and so of a person mm -hmm. you know yeah so i think there's that's a, a good line to draw for people is that like, it doesn't have to be like, you know, Hey, so-and-so in my house is like, got a terminal illness. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be that it can be sure. But you know, showing your, your own vulnerabilities, even in a minor way. Yeah. And so I think this should be practiced in all workplaces. I have a question for you about workplaces now though. Cause I really like what your answer is. Is there, a is the same ability to achieve what you're describing possible in very large companies yeah see that's where it's hard i, f I feel like that's where it needs to be broken down into teams and mm -hmm. you should be able to do that with your team like if you have a manager of let's say your team's like four to ten people maybe even 20 people 20 is a lot like this group that i've been working with i think there's six or seven of us um and yeah, so there's enough space and time for each of us to really contribute mm -hmm. in an hour and a half. And so I do think it needs to be a smaller team mm -hmm. slash meeting. It can't just be like, all right, all 50 of you, right, <laughs> let's like, hear what's going on. Like to give a, a good example, like how many people are on the floor at one time at a Walmart? Yeah. Like, can you achieve something like this if you've got, you know, 40 or 50 full-time staff mm -hmm. constantly working together in different shift patterns and everything like that what i think my i mean i'm making my own point which is like i think this gets incredibly difficult to do in bigger organizations and i think that's mm -hmm. you know something i've been thinking about recently is how we're kind of in this the down the downward trend of you know before we had a lot of technology we were small business space like whatever whoever was in your community who could provide a service did it and that was the extent of a business right maybe they hired a couple employees but like yeah. services got done on a local level you weren't hiring in some general contractor mega dude from wherever to come in or like big healthcare systems you had a local doctor and they could identify trends in the community and like all this other stuff so through mm. technology we've been able to maximize like the ability of one company and grow one company to provide national services. Mm -hmm. I feel like in a way we're on this trend back the other way now where technology is now so good that the small guy can provide a ton of value once again. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now 
somebody with just like some computer skills, understands a couple of programs and, you know, whatever can really do really deep, impactful work just like within a community, a smaller community. Like you can tackle a problem for your city on an individual level. And obviously you're not going to take care of the whole city, but you've got a lot more opportunity if you can learn how to leverage technology now in a way that's beneficial. And I think that that'll be a, a nice little renaissance we go through at some point where I think it's going to start to spark a lot of people to like be the solopreneur or the entrepreneur and start a little personal business. And like, you know, whether it's making goods, like I think we're getting to the point where enough people are like experimenting with, you know, making stuff out of leather or whatever, that you're just going to know the person in your city who does leather goods, you're going to need a belt and you're going to be able to ask them to try and make something. You know what I mean? And there's always going to be the super high end of fashion. There's always going to be all of that. But I, th- I don't know. I think we're going to go through an interesting rebuilding of that like mom and pop model. Yeah. That's uh, I hopefully able to revive a little bit of the small group, deeper connection between coworkers um, and maybe take a little bit, you know, if those bigger companies want to stay big, I think it'll be with less people and people are going to be able to go out and do more of the things they want. And they're like big companies are really going to be in, in the service industry because they're going to have to provide something that the small guy uses to get work done in a local setting. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that that's the case because I think there's a lot of benefit to being able to have these small employee groups who can come together, have these moments like you're talking about, but man, it's so hard when yeah. it comes to massive companies. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll follow this up with a question for you because mm-hmm. I'm curious about what your thoughts are, but I do think that like with the rise of using zoom or any type of online platform to meet like that, it can be more possible. Like, I'm sure, and I don't know, I haven't really worked in like a retail setting like that or a larger company to where there are different shifts throughout the day. And so it's hard to get a collection of people all at the same time when they don't have to be on the floor, don't have to be working and can just be in a meeting for an hour. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that they could schedule, even if it's like once every two weeks or once a month, a time saying, okay, during this time, you don't have to be at work yet. Like you can just log on to this meeting. You can be from home. You can be at work in a in a space that is more private. And we're just going to talk and check in and see how things are going. Yeah, except for all the people who are currently working the job, right? Like you can't be on the floor at a Walmart, for right. example, yeah. and be on a call like this that. This would have to be planned so that you know that like, okay, this one hour of my work, like maybe this, we change shifts so this the person working the shift prior works an hour later and then somehow an hour opens up. I don't know. They'd figure Mm -hmm. it out. Yeah. I think there's also a case to be made for like, you know, for a company that, excuse me, that is as big as like a Walmart, like just give everybody, I don't know. They could work in some kind of like in-person group meeting for you. You get to, use it as shift time. You're on the clock for this time, but you don't show up to work. You elected to do this instead of a last three hours of your day. And there's like some facilitated group meeting that occurs and like engages people in these types of discussions, but you get a couple hours, um, like let's say a month. So you would do 12 of them in a year Yeah, and you get, you know, I mean, what is it? Three or four hours of a shift of somebody like to keep employees happy. Like the people who do stats know that when you keep, get employee engagement up and people are happier at work, like people work better. So you can sacrifice a few hours a month. Right. That's what I'm so yeah. In your workspace, is there anything that's like this happening right now? And if there's not We check in daily as a team and there's plenty of banter to go along with the actual productive work call that we get a good but I will say too, there's a clear divide between people who are like ready and willing to engage in that and the people who just like to stay quiet on the call. Yeah. Um and then we try and because we are a decentralized team, we are all over Northern California. We do not meet as a group or have 
solely for this purpose type calls uh, on a regular basis. I'd say maybe, I mean, again, this is a weird year, so it was kind of hard to like figure out how and what that coordination would look like. But yeah, we've had team lunches before where like we've all gotten like a half day off and met at a restaurant. So we did that once before the lockdowns. And then, yeah, so if, I think if you added or if you took away an hour every two weeks and had this in your work um, like schedule with your teammates, do you think that that could potentially add to productivity? Do you think it would be detrimental? I don't think it'd be detrimental whether it would add or not. I don't know. It depends on, yeah, engagement. And yeah. How people and show I think up. too, it's like where I, I'm curious how much these types of things benefit the remote team. And what I mean by that is, do you feel like you're going to make the same progress with a human being that you're never going to actually meet? Is there like the same bond and benefit and like, like I'd, I'd be curious if the impact of Ashanti's mask meetings and the way that and meetings with ever forward and doing that project with the masks in a group works the same remote and has the same impact on somebody who's doing it remote, who doesn't know the people that are on this call with them. If that matters, mm. I would imagine it does. Mm -hmm. Like you have to know the people who you're kind of opening up to yeah. and you have to be op like open to them as well. So, I mean, there's no doubt it's, a, it's possible. Right. But I think that, you know, cause like people, create lifelong bonds with people through like being a pen pal and like mm -hmm. but that's a real like intimate one-on-one -on -one type of a thing when you have a pen pal or um you know when you really dive into a relationship with somebody through social media or whatever it is so in the workplace i don't know that it has the same impact because i think there's like this lack of selection on who these individuals are like i feel like a lot of times people the genesis of these relationships are dependent upon like some kind of commonality or a, a moment that they shared that like kind of sparked it where people go in already guarded when it's like, yeah, my employer's making me do this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I yeah. feel like it like inhibits the, the growth of those types of, of things and it just makes it hard, not impossible. So I don't know. I don't know that doing that via zoom is as impactful as I would like to hope that it would be. I'd like to hope that it'd be as just as impactful, but you know, I've got my reservations on it. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's definitely an important piece to note that like, I do know my coworkers, mm -hmm. even if I don't know them incredibly personally, like I know who they are. They're in the same, like a similar program as me. So I know that they're a student that they, they have those kind of stressors as well. Yeah. But like when you get into a workspace, you could be dealing with somebody who is at a very different point in their life, um, going through several different things outside of work. And it can be way more complex than, you know, just what we think it is. Yeah. And I mean, like, I have a group of 12 that I'm regularly working with. And like the thing I'll draw as the difference between people you work in person with and the people you don't is it's the speed at which you can become like accustomed to sharing with people. Like you walk into the office and you have a limp. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to learn something about you. We like deepen the bond. Mm -hmm. I don't see any of like, there's so much visual at, visualization at play in this where it is like, if I'm literally on a phone only, like Zoom is great for one thing, like, oh, nice, you got a haircut. Like, that's one thing, right? Mm -hmm. But like, man, there is a lot of things that we pick up on and can learn about the people we work with and deepen our respect and understanding for them by being in person. Yeah. You know, there so is. I, I think there's such a deeper connection that's formed that way. Like somebody comes in crying and then somebody stops their day to ask what's going on with that person. And like, that's a moment you just don't have via zoom calls, mm -hmm. you know? So I just yeah. think that there's a, there's a lot of things getting in the way of, of the work, person to person work. Yeah. And I think if we think on a, like a larger level now, 
this is a conversation we've had a few times, but just like, how does a company create a culture of trust, right? Like how do they start to allow their employee to feel that so that they feel comfortable even showing up in a space like that, if it was offered mm -hmm. and disclosing maybe some things that they might not feel comfortable disclosing if it is in a more competitive space that does not feel safe to do so. I'm going to even like challenge the question you're asking and I'm going to ask it again. And then I want you to like respond to my rephrase <laughs> question. Can a company foster a space with trust? Yes. Okay. And then, and then, Again, I think we add complexity. I would say yes as well with a asterisk next to it <laughs> because again, size of the company yeah. 100% matters. I think there's a threshold that is much lower than people want to give it credit for. Say more. I think we're talking like 20, 25 people. Yeah. I don't, and I think if you try and go more than that, you it's so hard. Mm-hmm. Because there's too many variables you just can't control at that point. Yeah. And I guess like saying the company, I'm more so speaking about the people that you directly interface with, like your manager, maybe the manager that they okay. so, attest so, to as well. So your question, I guess I should answer, try and answer it in a, the context of like, we're talking a company of 20 people where it's do where like where I think it is doable. How is it doable? Is that what you're asking? I mean, I even think on a larger level, like, could this be done? And can the CEO really impact something like that? And I think it, it has down. to be from the CEO, right? It has to start up there and then trickle yeah. down. Like, I think if you're a middle manager at a company with a bad culture and a CEO who doesn't support you, you will never change the culture mm -hmm. without changing the opinion of the CEO. Has to, has to, has to, has to has to or if you do if you're that middle manager and you change the culture for your team still won't, it's gonna still feel won't matter really difficult because you're not feeling right. respected by the the ceo and as much as you try to make decisions that are in the best interest of your people and continue to foster that trust you will constantly be undermined mm -hmm. when some bs comes down from the top that is not in support of the narrative you're trying to push. And then you're going to speak out of both sides of your mouth and people are going to lose trust in you. I just don't think mm -hmm. it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I just think this whole idea about and conversation about trust is so interesting. There's this clinical psychologist named Esther Perel. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have no, ever listened to anything. So she has a couple podcasts and she's relatively like famous. Um, She's been on like multiple famous podcasts for the most part. Mm -hmm. And she is known for her work in doing couples counseling okay, and just relationships in general. And she's even translated this now to like working in work relationships. I don't know too right, much. The dynamics in theory are probably very similar. Yes. She definitely applies a lot of what she learned exactly to the workplace yeah. and they're very relevant. <laughs> yeah. And she's so interesting. I don't remember the names of her podcast and I haven't listened specifically but she like has a session with a couple and she'll put that on the podcast. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And it's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, but she was on a podcast. I forget which one, but she was talking about trust and how we go to this like extreme with trust. Like if you mm -hmm. want to be trusted or if you're going to trust me, like there needs to be full transparency. And mm -hmm. she said like, no, that, there are things that like you should trust me with that I shouldn't have to share with you. Like that's a, a, the next level that's, of trust. Okay. I got you. You know what I mean? So like, if yeah. you were really curious about like what I was doing or where I was at, mm -hmm. you should trust that like it was, what I'm telling you is true, but you also shouldn't even have to ask the question if you feel I like wonder you if to there's go there. a correlation between being able to achieve that level of trust and something I've been thinking a lot about lately in, in terms of like personal growth and development, which is the idea of commitments and like, cause to feel a commitment, 
like you can't define it right mm -hmm. how do you how do you like show someone it's like how do you show or explain or tell somebody that you love them yeah right it's, exactly it's it's the expression of a commitment and i've and in something i've been listening to recently um that was a jordan peterson conversation one of the things that he says is commitment does not exist without sacrifice so i feel like what you're saying too could come like could come into play whereas like that level of trust is you know is if you feel a level of commitment from somebody you know that they're truly gonna do things for you look out for you then they will trust what you have to say mm -hmm. even without questioning it yeah you know and i feel like there's a a big piece there too because one of the things he was saying that i thought was super interesting is like that, that idea that trust or i'm sorry sacrifice is a necessary component to commitment mm -hmm. um and if you're willing to make the sacrifices to and you know what i mean like there's just such an interplay between the two of them if you are not willing to make the sacrifices it's probably evidence that you're not truly committed mm. and if you make the sacrifices it's representative of your commitment to that mm -hmm. to that thing yes you know i definitely think those two are very like playing off of each other yeah because i think that like if we think about this change to remote work and everybody feeling the the pressure to now return to work mm -hmm. even if remote work was doing well for the company and it was okay like what is that saying about trust for your employee and if your manager or whoever you're um going to and working for like in order for them to trust you they have to sense that you're committed like mm -hmm. they have to believe that right yeah and so there needs to be that that play off of each other mm -hmm. and if that doesn't exist then the trust is going to be lacking because it shouldn't ever have to be that somebody has to micromanage you right and if it does then <laughs> there's there's no trust <laughs> yeah there's also a component of growth that's a part of that too right yeah like if you're not willing to make like i'm if i'm a company right if if we went remote it was really successful but we want to like get everybody back into the work because we want to manage their work better because that's the way we've always done it so we you know that's the worst saying in business is like the way we've always done it like you've, <laughs> you've already been left behind um but yeah if you're not willing as a business to make a sacrifice of figuring out how to get your employees to work from home you are also showing that you're not committed to giving and doing the things for your employees the way that they want them and the mm -hmm. way that they may need them mm -hmm. and if you're not committed to your employees then i think yeah it calls into question you know what are your true motives as a business and why would somebody come work for you if you're gonna put on clear display that you're not committed to them mm -hmm. yeah and i'm gonna even tie in like responsibility too like if I don't feel trusted in my workspace. Like if I'm getting micromanaged, then I just feel like I have no responsibility for the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge takeaway from the commitment piece. Like I'm not going to be committed if I don't care about the work that I'm doing and I don't right. feel responsible for it. I'm just going to mm -hmm. do it. And it sounds like you're going to take the brunt of it because you're micromanaging me. Yeah. So, so be it. Yeah. Like this is, this is, these are, fundamental truths about growth mm -hmm. as a human being like as any living entity mm -hmm. right oh, man. we've talked yeah. about we talked about struggle at the beginning and like the fact that having having a difficult life experience is or and having adversity thrown at you is a, is going to be a part of life it's an inevitable of life and then we've talked about truth commitment sacrifice all of these things all of those things are organized together in the human experience as a way of helping people achieve more mm -hmm. you know it's it's a growth conversation and that like journey to 
you know, sacrificing things to reach a goal, being committed to a goal, to a target that you're setting out for yourself. Like there's so much benefit psychologically to setting goals, sacrificing for your goals, having a goal you're committed to, being able to be truthful with yourself about the state of your goals, being able to continue to move forward and like persevere and all like we're talking about like the human experience is all yes. we're talking about. Yeah. And this is, I feel like so relevant to today or I mean, yeah, the human experience in general, but how there has kind of been a culture of this generation of like parents not wanting their kids to struggle, not wanting their kids to fail. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that does place a lack of trust within them. Mm -hmm. Like it should be that I trust that you can get through this. Not that I trust that you're going to succeed because mm -hmm. you might fail, but there's been this move towards, you don't have to try, I'll do it for you so that I know that you'll succeed. But that doesn't, that takes away that responsibility piece. That takes mm -hmm. away the sacrifice that you have to make. It takes away the commitment that they might have to make. Yeah. I was about to ask, do you think that we have a bigger issue with parents who don't want to let their kids struggle or, and this could, the, the answer could be, yeah, they're the same. So mm -hmm. tell me if you think they're the same or if they have enough nuance or the parent who never pushes their kid to be committed to anything. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's both in that. Like yeah. Both are in that. Like I don't yeah. want my kid to fail. Mm -hmm. And like the, the, the give and take with that is that I don't want them to be committed to something. <laughs> yeah. I think by, I think when a parent tries to over when you try and take out the struggle that a child is going to experience and growth that's going to come through that struggle, you take out their commitment to things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can't commit without sacrifice. You're not sacrificing without a little struggle. Mm -hmm. So by not letting them struggle, you're never letting them be committed. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, you know, and again, generational things like these are, are always changing but like one thing i heard as a kid was like you know if you're like you made a commitment to this team you're showing up to practice even if you don't want to go mm -hmm. you know like if there was a commitment that was made especially when i made a commitment and other people were beholden to me like you had to do it mm -hmm. and then when the season's over like i think there was a a season of like flag football that i played as a kid and i like just wasn't into it and i didn't want to do it anymore and I remember being told that like when the season's over, you don't have to play ever again, but you committed to the season. So you're going to finish the season. And it's just like one of those things where, you know, that just seeing it through, mm -hmm. you know, even when it got hard. Yeah. Was a big growth and learning opportunity that I feel like, yeah, when, you know, a parent wants to go and like complain for their kid for why their kid is getting treated unfairly on the sports team it's like it, i mean <laughs> if they're committed and they want to continue to work hard and they're good enough like they will succeed and if they're not good enough then they can find other commitments mm -hmm. they don't have to be committed to the same thing their whole life yeah it's not the and they don't have, all be all and they don't have to be committed to the things you want them to be committed to as a parent, yes <laughs> you know yeah so it's just a very interesting dynamic so i thought i'd pose that alter alternate to uh the lack of struggle is also like our kids even committed to things anymore. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we could go on this topic all day because yeah. the instant gratification buzzword thrown out there, but like songs are getting shorter. I was listening to a, a video today talking about this, like songs are getting shorter. There's a new like famous know about person Freebird. artist. Yeah. There's a new famous person or music artist that's like blowing up each week. There's some great new topic or video that's blowing up each week. Everyone wants sound bites. Like we want all these things so rapidly and so fast now. And it's like, we can't sustain that long attention mm -hmm. and we can't sustain that. Like if, if we're struggling, screw it. Like I'll move on to the next thing right now. Like, yeah. Who cares? Right. Yep. Like there's something else that's going to 
fire off my dopamine right now. I mean, like, yeah, like you're in the middle. Uh, we've used the video game me- as a metaphor for like things that are translating into real life too. You can just turn it off. Yeah. If you if you're like playing Call of Duty and you're sucking, you can turn the game off. Rage quit. Get out Ra- of there. Get rage quit. Yeah. Going. And then like all of a sudden, what? Like you're just gonna rage quit life. Yeah. You're gonna get out there and you're not gonna like the way something's treating you and you're just gonna quit. Yeah. I think there's a real question about whether or not there's a a epidemic of quitting out there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we're not saying that these parents are poorly intentioned. We know doing this on this purpose. Is, they love their yeah, children. And they want to protect them and save them. But these uh, these extremes are showing up. Like mm-hmm. the costs are showing up of them. Yeah. And... Yeah, we'll, uh, we're learning. That's right. We got kind. Of, we didn't get off topic, but um, we really got into this whole workplace conversation, which I think yeah. is an interesting one because I do think it's like similar to how Ashanti saw these masks very much in the school setting. Mm-hmm. Like these things are very much applied to the workplace setting. Yeah, they as well. perpetuate society. It's not yeah. a. It's not a school like issue yeah but i that's i i think about how the two are similar right like you go to school it's like your work it's like work your is job. school for grown-ups yes yeah and now you go to work and it's like putting on my mask yeah and especially if you wear a mask for from birth essentially not literally but like from the first time your identity starts to be formed all the way through college mm-hmm. and you never identify what's going on in your mask and then you go into the workplace and think you're just going to be some different person, you're just fooling yourself. Mm. Like you're the same person. So, you know, you've grown, mm-hmm. you're, you have different qualities, you you make different decisions now, sure, but you've never fully, if you've never fully taken off the mask and you know, been honest with yourself about what's on the other side. You're probably still carrying around a lot of stuff that's on the inside of that mask. Mm-hmm. Yeah, name it and claim it. Name it and claim it. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was uh, nice having this conversation with you today, Brendan, and you as well for the listeners and viewers. Cheers! cheers. Thanks for tuning in, Slancha. If you made it this far. We're deep. You know, give yourself a pat on the back. Yeah. I'm going to give myself a pat on the back later. <laughs> yeah. Well done. I deserve it. Self-care. All right. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Brennan, any last words? See you in the next one. Oh, actually, do you want to sure. share? <laughs> do you want to share the joke that you shared with me earlier? You know, this could be nice for the people to hear. To, on an end note. I fear I will share it. <laughs> I fear that it's too common and you hadn't heard it. And most people are going to have heard this already. Well, I'm going to laugh again. And it's going to make me feel good. So you might as well just share. Do you know how to make a tissue dance? No. You put a little boogie in it. <laughs> All right. Later, everyone. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>